Right. Well, this, I, I have to say this is the first time I've ever been asked to do an encore, so it just shows how good Susie is and how good her work is, <laughs> that we actually get to do the talk again. Yes. And I would say we could, you know, iron out all those rough bits from the last time, but actually it went quite well so. last time, so I'm not sure if that jinx is today. Oh, or, no, no. Hopefully not. Hopefully it's going to be even better. Night. It's going to be even better. Um, it, what's lovely is that you all clearly know Susie to be in her actual studio, um, and that is a real privilege to, to talk about an artist's work in the studio where the work was made. Um, and I probably don't need to introduce her to you because you're all friends. Um, but I think she needs a little bit of introduction because um, Susie, probably a bit like myself, is rather self-deprecatory and uh, puts herself down. And is a brilliant <laughs> artist and we all deserve to, um, to applaud that. So hopefully today you'll get to um, understand a bit why she looked at T.S. Eliot um, and how these magnificent works come into being. I first started looking at um, Susie's work nearly 20 years ago now and her career extends beyond that. But even beyond that, she managed to put in a PhD in English literature, which, if you didn't know that, probably makes sense of why we are looking at works on T.S. Eliot, why you've looked at Shakespeare, Andrew Marvel, um, the list goes on. Uh, but actually, this talk came about because Susie and I worked on, on this book. It's a brilliant essay by Susie, it's an essay by me, and all, most of the works in, the, in here that Susie's kindly put up for you to see again are in this book. Yeah. Um, but we need to go back kind of further than that to why the book existed, why the work exists really, because Susie was part of an exhibition a year ago in Margate. So I think really we need to start right back, even mm -hmm. further than Margate, with mm -hmm. why you were interested in T.S. Eliot in the first place. Um, yeah, that goes back a very long way <laughs> <laughs> to my school days and I was um, always captivated by Eliot and we had a very good um, English teacher and she introduced us to the figure of the Cumean Sibyl, who is in the epigraph to the Wasteland. And there was this dread, I remember, that um, was associated with this Sibyl figure. And she quoted this um, bit from uh, Virgil's Aeneid about the, uh, the Sibyl chanting from the shrine her dread enigmas and booming from the cavern her truths wrapped in darkness <laughs> and, and so all this sinister language really um, appealed to me and then subsequently I, when I read the beginning of the poem there was this um, this passage about April being the cruelest month and I was thrilled by this because as a rather melancholy teenager I didn't particularly like spring and you were meant to like spring and everybody else liked <laughs> spring and I thought, well, Eliot doesn't really like it. And actually, on the radio <coughs> two days ago, there was a poem by D.H. Lawrence called um, The Electrifying Spring, or something like that, where he said that, he, that spring kind of made him feel um, redundant or everything was bursting out, that spring made him feel like a shadow and rather distressed. And anyway, so the negativity of the wasteland really appealed to me at that time, but it stayed with me all these years. It's quite, I mean, I can understand the melancholy appealing to a teenage girl, but it's quite a difficult poem. It's difficult as mm. an adult, so it's quite difficult to grasp that poem or grapple yes. with that poem as a child, but you really felt a connection with it, even that early. Yeah, well, I think um, I read a critic, I think maybe Conrad Aiken, who said, you don't need to understand it all, just go with the flow. <laughs> yes. I want to go back to, um, just while we wait for people to come back, to talk about how the show came about, because there was a show called In the Violet Hour, I think? Yes, it was... Um, sorry. No, and it was, in, it was held in Margate, but it, yeah. it was not your average show. It wasn't at no. uh, Turner Contemporary, it wasn't in White Cube. You describe <laughs> it as... Yeah, it was the opposite end of Margate from Turner Contemporary, the other end of the beach. And um, it was the most disgusting hotel and uh, apparently Elliot may have gone there for drinks when he was um, staying in Margate um, because he um, went there after having a, had a nervous breakdown to recover and he used to go to the beach every day and he used to go to this bus shelter where he wrote part of part three of the wasteland and uh, the bus shelter is about um, 100 yards from the rotting hotel anyway so the curators got the hotel um, to be opened up for artists to <coughs> install work and we all had a room each 
and it was a terrible ordeal because the hotel was filthy, it stank, you know, there were rats, the carpet was rotting and the wallpaper was Most peeling. Most of us would have, would have run away. <laughs> oh, and I could have been ill, actually, because there were pigeons all over the place making mess. Mm. And um, I had to clear all the mess up to, in order to hang work. And uh, the, the work as in the book was hung from floor to ceiling. Salon style, like the Royal Academy, but different. <laughs> and um, anyway, so yeah, it was quite appropriate in a way to Elliot because Elliot was very fastidious and impeccably dressed and had a very keen sense of smell and couldn't bear filthy, dirty odours and so on. And I think he would have sort of appreciated his work, which is about quite filth and dirt, all the way stand is being um, enshrined in this particular yeah. hotel. And it's lovely because the 100 years ago, which is roughly when mm, um, he was there, yes. 22, mm. um, it wouldn't have been in that state. It would have been a no, beautiful very splendid. hotel on the beach. So yes. in a way, you kind of you you kind of have that schism in time that he... That's true, yes. You have the, the smart Elliot of mm-hmm. the past, but then you have really what Elliot was writing about, which was often quite disturbing. Absolutely, and, yes. And dark and dirty. Yeah. And this sense of crumbling buildings, which he writes about in East Coco in the Four Quartets as well. This sense of time and decay and, mm. um, and memory as well, and revisiting the past. Yeah. And in the show, you, you actually painted on the doors. I mean, you, you wrote on the, yes. on the kind of Artex walls, not quite a ceiling, but yes. I mean, and the, although you put work up here, it was even more hung in, you know, salon style, as yes, you describe it. Yes, there was, it. was so, more work, because I sold some from the last show, so we haven't got those <laughs> So you have work, to be quick so. if you want any, it's clearly <laughs> going down. <laughs> anyway, they, they were absolutely cluttered, the whole room, <clears> with, as you say, quotations. But Faber wouldn't allow, allow me to use quotes in the book, so unfortunately we couldn't um, match pictures with, with quotations. <laughs> but you still have that lovely um, feel of the work, kind of cheek by jowl, up to it and I, I yes. think that's a really important part of the series because often work can exist independently and clearly these works can be taken apart from the series mm. but there's something lovely because the poem is so fragmentary and everything is squashed together in the poem yes. and you suddenly have these jump cuts yes it it makes sense really in how you installed it that you would have um two people going at it on a, in a bed sit next to someone like this kind of yes. contemplating the meaning of life the by the and the glory. yeah or you'd have a most magnificent garden so you would you would really kind of splice everything together yeah. which yeah. to me made me think of you know it, you sort of manifested the poem not just in the work but in the way you hung it as well yes i wanted it to be fragmentary and not to be a narrative and um, because i when pound was editing the wasteland he wanted to cut out bits that had a story attached to them and he wanted that untidy, messy, chaotic feel. And he not only cut out bits which were too disgusting to be published, but he, he also um, excised things that were too, made too neat a, a story out of things. So hence my jump cuts and, and hence the book, which doesn't really have... I mean, it clumps certain subjects together, but it doesn't really have a narrative going through at all. No, that's a perfect segue. I was just about to move on to the book. Well, yeah. um, we are going to go deeper into the themes of the paintings, but I think it's quite good to know the, where this work came from. So there was the exhibition of 23 other artists, I yes. think. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after that, Susie decided that it hadn't really been seen enough. Mm. Uh, and so the book and uh, a, a display at Paul Stolper followed. Yes. Um, and <laughs> in the book, it's quite, this is quite humbling, because I, I'm a writer, this is what I do for a living, Susie's essay is amazing, which is really quite humbling because really I've spent my whole life trying to write and Susie has spent her whole life painting. <laughs> but oh, it's know. a very good essay. Thank you. Um, and, but I want to talk about the title because the title is really important. Mm-hmm. Susie called it Tentacular Roots. Mm-hmm. And I think the quote you have it from, which you probably know by heart, is um, a network of tentacular roots reaching down to the <laughs> deepest terrors and desires. Cool. So it's really, this is <laughs> Elliot, two years before he publishes The Wasteland. Yes. And you've taken... A, a little mm. bit mm. of that. Tell us why you took a bit of that. Well, because I like depth. I mean, although I appreciate certain postmodern works of art, which are to do with surface and the idea that depth is either doesn't exist or isn't important, I like what Jeanette Winterson, the writer, said about Elliot. She called him depth charge Elliot. And <laughs> it seems to me that um, as soon as I open these 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 poems, these books, it does really take you down into this this abyss of, of, of something illimitable. There's, there's a kind of um, infinite space. 
and it's dark and it's shadowy and it's um, mournful and full of lamentation at times, but it's also full of glory and light and kind of squibs of, of um, beauty. And so as opposed to shutting something down, which a lot of one-liner type art, contemporary art seems to do for me, Eliot opens things out, it's kind of centrifugal. And uh, I, just, I just love the, the suggestive, shadowy, um, endless possibilities in, in his work. And that's such a beautiful way of describing it because your work does a very similar thing, that you kind of plumb down into these emotional depths. We connect with it. Be, although we look at it visually, we connect with it physically. And the poem can do that to you and your works can do that to <coughs> you. And the way you describe it, because there's a lot of it is written about the afterworld and a kind of Hades-like mm -hmm. hell, but it goes beyond that from what you're saying. It's sort of unfathomable, unlimited space that he inhabits. Yes. I mean, I, I like things that... I, I mean, I'm a figurative painter, but I like things verging on abstraction by which things lose their identity and their neatness and become um, maybe menacing, but they become mysterious. And for me, abstraction is a realm of, of mystery so that things um, transition from being clear named objects to being um, carriers of, of a meaning that isn't clear, but is full of sort of pregnant with menace and mm. mystery. And hence yeah. this unfathomable space. Yes. Which is necessary. Yes, I think so. I mean, that's that's what Eliot does for me and and for uh, and other poets that I love, like Andrew Marvel. I mean, Eliot said that he um, he has a connection with um, the in, an inexhaustible and terrible nebula of emotion. And... <laughs> You know, it's, it's very um, troubling, I suppose, all, all these remarks, but for me, they, they mean a lot. And, I mean, this is what we turn to art, this is what I turn to art for, is that ability to see something that you can't quite grasp, or mm. to, but to feel it. Yeah. Um, and the same with Eliot's poetry. And interesting you say that a lot of contemporary art doesn't plumb those depths. Mm. Um, there's something that I touch on briefly in the essay I wrote, but um, Stephen Jay Gould wrote a book called Time's Arrow, Time's Cycle. Oh, yes. And that, to me, is... What you touch and and Eliot is this idea of time cycle, this kind of imminence of life that life is way bigger than the people in this room or the people on this planet. Yes, that we're not just jumping from one linear thing to uh -huh. another on the surface. That there is this yes. vastness, this and huge unfathomableness yes. to to life mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we can't grasp. Yeah, but you try. Well, I do try, but I suppose. Th th the unfinished nature of my work and the messy nature of my work are, are things that I find helpful in trying to do that because um, all my mess <laughs> is a way of suggesting something incomplete and that doesn't shut things down to a, to, um, a finished, finished state. Yes, yeah, so you allow room for us, the, the viewer, to, to yes. move about in it and True. find a... Yes, and to, to invent and dream new forms, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I think if we move on to the, the themes in... Um, there's so many ways we could take this conversation. I know we haven't got the longest amount of time. Um, I think the first thing I'd like to... Um, talk about with you in terms of um, getting a bit deeper with the work and please feel free to look around the room because all this work I think I'm right in saying is all from the series yeah um, all, all on these walls you yeah. will see a color theme I think particularly the one placed just behind my head um a violet of mauve and if you know Susie's work historically this is not unusual a lot of your series have this purpley rich purpley color yes, or bright yes, paints I gravitate or acid. Towards it, yes. but this is a massive color for <clears throat> Elliot too and it mm. sort of suggests to me that you've Consciously or unconsciously, Eliot has been a part of your life for quite yes. a Yes, well, I mean, there are the so many things to do with Eliot, the figure in the wilderness and, mm -hmm. and um, figures, explorers in the snow, and, and indeed violet. And uh, Eliot seems to like violet-coloured flowers, not just the violet hour, but he likes hyacinths, he likes lilacs. And I think it, I think it has something to do with, with memory and those heady scents mm -hmm. taking you back in time. And therefore, I think it's something to do with, in Eliot at any rate, with loss, something in the past, or something to do with some of, of a desire that wasn't realised when he says mixing memory and desire. Yes. And commentators have uh, mentioned a, a young man he was very fond of in Paris, Jean Verdenal, 
who apparently greeted him in the Luxembourg Gardens waving a branch of lilac. So maybe that um, is part of that opening. Kind of Christian yes, memory yes, that possibly. infiltrates the Indeed, poem. yeah, yeah. Um, so there's all that kind of the sort of sadness and the beauty attached to Violet. But with me also, um, I <coughs> tended to, at one point, tended to go drawing and painting in shopping malls and supermarkets, where I noticed these sort of violety, pinky, creamy, muted colours of, of pills and sweets and pants and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I also noticed that they were opaque, and so I started thinking about the opaque and the <coughs> hidden and mystery again, my favourite subject. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, did, I did some houses in, in France which were um, both violet and pink, and one of those... There's an example of them. They were violet and pink and sort of and creamy. And the houses in France at midday in sunlight were all shut up. And I was, you know, outside, an outsider, an English person in France. And there was no one around and they were kind of desolate. But for me, they were also enigmatic because they were opaque. You couldn't see through them. And violet is, or mauve is, is an opaque colour. It's white added to purple. So, um... This opacity, this this enigmatic quality, and this desolation were, were things that I wanted to combine in in that series, mm. which kind of is a bit astray from Eliot, but I think he he got me liking Mauve in the <laughs> first place. Yeah, well, it's there, in, as you say, in I mean, there's a dinner party uh, uh, um, below that oh, yes, that has that kind light. of violet mm. light, and mm. and as you say, Eliot, I mean, there's there's dozens of references within the poem and mm-hmm. 450 words uh, 430 line poem it, there's an, a huge repetition of that one colour as you say it's Violet. clearly yeah, very important yeah, yeah. it often comes at night or in the morning yes um uh, violet light or the the light of the fisherman coming back from the sea or it would come at those kind of moments which it made me think of your work again because of that idea of transition from day to night yes because your work is all about transitions about mutation about Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. mutability Mm. and there's something about it's very interesting you say those are daytime pictures because I've always thought in the um the ones done in France that they're they're more twilight because of that really you know you see the rich purple sky it's just sometimes that's the sky is so hot and intense it kind of bears down on you as if it's as if it's quite dark or maybe you get up you're slightly dizzy and things go dark when they should be light but uh and it, no, they were done at noon, and everybody was inside having lunch, and I felt this special kind of, kind of, Sartrean nausea of the <laughs> the empty street and and the uh, intense sunlight. And you could, you know, that's making me think of De Chirico and and because oh, I was yes. about to talk to you about shadows, because at the beginning and end of the day, <clears throat> mm-hmm. the shadows are longest, and there's mm. um, you know shadows are. Uh, uh, increasingly prominent in your work, I think yes. that's fair to say. Something you're very interested in. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. And again, I got that possibly from from Eliot with the, the figure in the wasteland walking east and the shadow behind him in the morning and rising to meet I've him. I've got it written down. You're just you're okay. just citing it off the top of your head. <laughs> no, that's well, it. The shadow behind you in the morning and the shadow in front of you at night. Yes, it's a lovely visualization of the shadow. But your relationship to shadows is is this different to that. Yes. Well, I mean, it's partly that thing of going through time and ending up as a handful of dust and the melancholy of, of the figure in time with his its shadow as the angle of the sun changes. But um, I think for me, the, the painted shadow is more frozen than the shadow in poetry. And I'm particularly fond of de Chirico's painting and other surrealists in which there are these figures um, very, very static and I mean, I know paintings are static, but these are figures with shadows absolutely s- standing st- stone stock still and sunk in this kind of ennui and melancholia. And there's a painting I particularly like called The Melancholy of a Beautiful Day by de Chirico. And I kind of thought about this because I, I felt this melancholy of a beautiful, of beautiful weather, and as I've, I think I've touched on before. And I thought, why? Why do I feel like this? And I, I thought... Um, and I found it in De Chirico, and I also found it in existential novels, The uh, the Outsider and, and La Nose. And I thought it has something to do with the shadow which inscribes the figure in, in, in time, as in space, um, expressing a sense of the figure's limitation and 
finitude. And I thought to myself that it's like time is passing, the sun is shining, it's saying, do something, choose, get out. And existentialism <laughs> says, you know, do something significant, choose and, and get out. But whatever you choose to do, you're aware of opportunities missed, choices not made. And it's a bit like in Eliot, and Eliot seemed maddened by choice. He says, you know, do I dare to eat a peach? Shall I part my hair behind? And um, the woman in the wasteland says, what shall, what shall I do now? What shall I do? And this thing about choosing what to do, and um, in a minute there is time for decisions and revisions that a minute will reverse. It is an issue with Eliot, and the whole thing about the shadow expressing where you are and the limit of where you are and what you've done and, and consequently what you haven't done and where you are not generates for me this kind of melancholy. And it's as if um, there's um, this abundance of choice meeting this reality of limit. And that's why I think... I get depressed in sunlight. <laughs> Which is the opposite of, of a lot of people, but a very I know, articulate reasoning I know, it's a very... It's a very b- I know one other person, Louisa Buck, <laughs> the art <laughs> critic, who suffers from You've both got to go to Alaska or something in the... I uh, think in so. In the, in the time of year. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it, it's, it's, it's odd. I, I, I wish more people felt it. But I think having analysed it for myself, at any rate, I'm better. Do you start to you understand it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you think there's because you paint quite quickly? I mean, some of these little sketches are done mm-hmm. quite quickly. Is mm. that is that a does that tap into that kind of FOMO thing you talk about? That fear of missing out. That mm. if I make this no, choice, FOMO, I can't do good. another one. I suppose so. Yeah. I mean, aware I'm aware of because I gave up painting for so long until Peter got me back into it. I'm aware of time passing and 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 then you know wanting to paint all the time and make use of time, redeem the time, as I think the Bible says. So. Mm. Anyway, um, also, in when I go painting in the street in Morocco, this was, I think, Fez, Marrakesh, uh, things are moving so fast, I've only got a few seconds, and I was squ- squatting by <laughs> the mosque in Fez, and just doing figure after figure after figure, because um, you, have to, you have to be very quick. You've also sketched on beaches and yeah. in supermarkets, so yes. you're not choosing the easiest places. <laughs> no. And some of the people you choose are at the extremes of society and size. Mm-hmm. I'm just thinking of the beaches as some much larger than life people. Yeah. Does anyone ever look at you strangely and come yes, chasing they do. after you? Yes, they don't. <laughs> well, the, the, the women, if they, a lot of my figures are done from behind because I don't want to be seen doing them. It seems <clears> terribly invasive. And if, if they do see me doing them, they, they glare. They absolutely glare. And I, I think I, I've had a few incidents, and qu'est-ce que vous faites, madame, and so on. And, um, I uh, kind of get out of it somehow. And I did have to buy spy glasses because I wanted to take <laughs> pictures in supermarkets. I wasn't allowed to, so I got these glasses which recorded um, footage. Watch out if you ever see Susie. <laughs> <laughs> I've given up using them now. But they recorded these women, my targets, these biggish women in the aisles, and I did a whole series from them. But um, even those were rather strange looking. They're very heavy frames. <laughs> staring. <laughs> They're probably around. staring back at you, thinking, who is this crazy lady? They did <laughs> think it was crazy, but anyway, I got my pictures done. Well, that's <laughs> good. But, I mean, we need to point out, which I'm sure you all know, um, even though you draw relentlessly from the figure none mm. of the final works i think i'm right in saying come mm. from they're not observe you know you're not getting a model to pose in the studio and observing no. them and they come more from your memory they come from yes. drawing repeatedly yes. and then coming back out on yes on i mean they come paper. from yeah a mixture really of drawing i like drawing from life a lot and um even in Recently, I've been in going to ballets and theatres and drawing these these poses because that's a real challenge. Doing really fast-moving, extraordinary metamorphic poses. Mm-hmm. But yes, memory and and the pictures are mainly done in here, in this cave. So you charge your memory by going out into the streets or the beaches yes. or or what have you, and then you come back and yeah, I mean let it, them loose. It, yes, yes, indeed. I mean, if you if you've drawn a lot, you kind of you sort of got you built up a vocabulary of, of how things go and how the shadows are and how the light is and but I need to keep recharging and going out there and and looking at people as they go about and, mm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, in in um, 
the, this series. I'm not sure if they are up here. Oh yes, there are. There's some behind uh, behind Peter. Sorry, Peter. Um, there's some of the sordid incident of the when the clerk comes to visit the typist. Oh yes, that's dirty. Yeah. <laughs> but I think what I wanted to um, talk to you about with that is because in Elliot the figures are extreme. They they get up to a variety of things, but we only get glimpses of them. That's mm. quite a detailed scene in mm. in Elliot where you 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 hear a lot about the squalid situation she lives in, and then this man comes and she's not bothered about sex, but he he takes his way anyway mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. comes back. Mm-hmm. I mean, you you like to get to these moments with figures when even when they're together. There's a sense of isolation. Yeah. So in that we have you have have responded to that part of the wasteland, and they couple, but it's yeah. almost like they're. Well, I think isolation's a big thing with with Elliot. I suppose all my figures tend to be isolated, and even though I don't feel isolated now, I think it goes back. I, I think art goes back to early feelings and and situations and memories and and very very isolated as a child and perhaps has fed into all these single figures um and and with Elliot you know he was an outsider as an American in England in London and some people say that's why his his satirical eye is so acute he's so he looks on things so sourly from a distance you know and caricatures women particularly um and he found it also very difficult to speak to people and you know he says i prepared a face to meet the faces that you meet and um in proof rock he says you know how can he begin to transmit tr- um, his experience how can he begin to communicate with people so there is this incredible sense of him being absolutely sort of walled up and um, um he can express himself in this wild poetry but as a man in society he was very buttoned up and very mocked by the Bloomsbury Bohemians for being so buttoned up. And very fastidious in his dress, and that oh, yes. comes back to all yes. of that. Yes, yes, absolutely. But interesting, if he did have a lover in Paris, he was married in the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that we can feel from some of your figures are very androgynous. We're not sure if they're yes. men or they're women. No. Um, the same in his poetry. He talks about Tiberius, I Tiresias, think, of having yes. breasts. Or mm. there, there's you know a line where he talks about, I'm not sure of what the gender is. Is it a man or a woman? Which, yeah. if we think back to 100 years ago, this is yes. quite shocking yes. or provocative. Ahead of his time, once yeah. again. Yeah. But what's your reason for some of your figures are clearly, we have them above Susie's head this time, um, very uh, very much women. But there are quite mm. a lot where you can hardly make out the figure, so it's very impossible to work out whether they're a man or a woman. Yes, <coughs> it's a good question. Um, <laughs> um, Do you mm. see it as kind of every man, every person? And every figure. I don't think I do. I mean, I'm, I think Anthony Gormley's figures are like that. I think for me, it's it's more the sense of of mystery again, and things that are liminal. You know, you don't quite know. You don't quite know what you're looking at or what's going to emerge. And with the work I'm doing now on on Ovid, um, that's even more um, applicable, really, because things are. Off- changing all the time and, and unstable so I think it's to do with an instability and of identity and a mystery about what this thing is this this person is and possibly because of their isolation I, I haven't thought about this before but they don't have a um, a committed or or um, happy kind of sexuality and I think um, Elliot's sex in the wasteland certainly is a, is a tragic affair I mean he's got all these women who commit suicide from, from for love and um, the woman with the abortions that haven't worked and everything seems to be a mess when it, when it comes to sex um, and I think these these brooding figures haven't emerged into a nice domestic or sexual happiness they're sort of stuck in this Fisher King state like yeah, that for, figure you, I don't think the Fisher thing. King I mean apart from we have the, someone on the canal back yeah, behind yeah. me how um, there that was yeah. y- yes um, but for, the, for um, Elliot the grail the, the grail myth of Fisher King was mm. hugely influential I mean he wrote interestingly later after the poem was published he wrote copious notes on where all his very smart um, references came from and you know clearly very well read but the, the first one he says is this is very much about the grail 
and the, yes. and the Fisher King myth. Mm-hmm. And the idea that the king was wounded in the groin, he becomes effectively impotent, his mm-hmm. kingdom is mm-hmm. infertile, and the people in his land are infertile. Mm-hmm. But here comes a jolly uh, knight, on, and he has to go off on a quest, wh- whether he's Percival or um, Gawain, and goes off and tries to rescue the kingdom. So while he's away, there's hope. Mm-hmm. But the kingdom itself languishes in in despair and yes. and aridness and the poem is laced with this isn't it about mm-hmm. the desire for thunderstorms the arid plains mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. about all hope sort of being lost but at the end there's just a little bit of hope yes i mean the, the the fisherman is still at the end and he says shall i set my lands in order and he's fishing with the arid plain behind him but there is hope with religious imagery coming in and i think it starts getting slightly hopeful when St Augustine um, is referred to and he says, um, O Lord, thou pluckest me out, burning, burning, burning. And there's the idea of being redeemed from from desire, though. I, I think that for Eliot, at that stage in his life, desire and sex were very problematic. And even though the poem as a whole is full of a kind of hints of hope through the thunder coming and the light and Hinduism and shanti, 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 um, the redemption that Eliot is is intuiting or seeking is a redemption which isn't which doesn't at that stage involve um, a happy mm. romantic life um, and the Fisher King is still wounded in the groin. <laughs> <laughs> but this this is why I think the the, the pairing of you and Eliot is really um, acute or astute, sorry, um, because in your work you often practically kill your figures. Mm. You you burn them or the yeah, light. I love doing you know, that. you, yeah, you yeah. use light, <laughs> but you are you are literally torching them effectively mm, yeah. with the light. Yeah, I'm a they dissolve. Nasty that. piece of work. <laughs> <laughs> but that's yeah. what make the work so um, interesting, so fascinating, yes. because the figure still holds on despite you yes, doing all these nasty just, things, them throwing paint at them, and yeah, as you you said in picturing people, isn't it? You said they were resilient, and mm. I hadn't thought of that before, but they bloody well are resilient, <laughs> aren't they? But I do like. Um, attacking the figure and mm. I suppose I, I set the figures in quite um, difficult situations like um, deserts and ice fields and rather alienating banquets and dining rooms um, and um, not only the situation but the form of painting is an assault and I reduce the figure to mess, oh, I don't reduce it to mess but I bombard it with mess with spots and smears or encroaching on it with lines or, or something like that and attacking it so it's making the figure more vulnerable I suppose and often those spots and smears can seem quite universal you know literally like the universe in some of your beach scenes um, they, they, you kind of throw paint at the at the sky but it looks almost like a, a universe up there but equally it's quite cancerous it's quite yes. toxic on a cellular level so you have this sort of micro macro thing going on in your work quite yes, a lot. I, like, I, I do like uh, uh, not quite knowing where something is I mean the blot is on the surface of the painting on the picture plane but you don't know if it's a huge cell a cancerous cell or a far away mm. planet um, and how do you know when to stop because you talked about not wanting to finish the work totally you want mm. to leave the space the viewer mm. but when you're using chance in that way if you're throwing to create those organic yeah. shapes you have to have yeah. an element of chance then when do you know well it's difficult I mean I don't sort of get it right really I, I throw away things probably that, that were all right and I keep things that have to be thrown away <laughs> subsequently <laughs> um because it, it's really difficult to know I think you can just it's good having a studio because when I go home I leave it and then I come back the next day or day, two days later and think oh well this is what I want to do to this picture um whereas I didn't know before that it was um, so awful, or, <laughs> or actually, I think it's it's all right, and I'll leave it. But I, I, you know, you can go too far with painting and make something dead through overworking. Um, and I do like the quickness of, of things that somehow work very spontaneously and freshly. Because you've always had an element of your figures being silhouettes, or or not being able to, you know, you don't fin- fully finish them. And I'm thinking the horse and riders from mm-hmm. mm-hmm. two thousand two, or or the beach scenes, but increasingly, particularly with this series, there's a speed to it and, and kind of urgency. And you really are leaving, quite often you're leaving us with just an outline that we then build in our minds to a figure. Yeah. That you want to, you want, you're going further and further with this abstracting the figure, it feels like. Yes, I do like to push things. And I mean, I'm interested in the extremes and I, the, the, uh, and then the extreme of, 
of comprehension when you get to a, a point where you're not quite sure what you're looking at. I mean, you, you know that it's a figure, but it has gone, um, as you say, in, in quite an extreme direction of abstraction. But, I mean, as I said, abstraction for me is, is really important mm. because it's, 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 it's losing the, um, the neatness and the, and the finish of something and, and going on to, into something much more suggestive. Mm. It's interesting when you mentioned briefly that you're working from Ovid now. And mm. I remember the first time you told me about Ovid, I went, oh, it was like an, a no-brainer. Like, of course you're going to yeah. look at Ovid. It's just because it's such a natural fit for you, mm. that idea, because at the heart of that is transformation. Mm. Is that series going to be done, is it in a similar style to this? Is, or are you going back to the big-scale painting? Or? Well, I've done, I've done some big-scale paintings, and there's one in a show which Paul Stolper is putting on next week. It's a big bacchanalia, and it's more abstract in a way. Um, it's just this riot of shapes and things turning into um, mess and limbs and all sorts of things coming coming out. Uh, but it, it's sort of in this style, but the <coughs> figures are more fantastical and the metamorphosis is more extreme. Um, and I, I kind of have invented my own mythology in a way. I've, I've sort of taken of it and... Um, I've used it for my own purposes because there's the figure in Ovid Kerberos who is the many-headed dog guarding Hades so that people can't escape. <laughs> so I've made this dog into my own little creature who, who barks at metamorphosis. And so the dog is a kind of figure of stability. And <laughs> there's, a, there's a creature, a, a human, a humanoid figure that's turning into something else and the dog is barking at it. That's hard to do in a static painting. <laughs> I can't wait to see that. Um, yeah. I'm but they are, they're equally, you were talking about the mess in them as well. They're very spontaneous and free. Oh, yes. Because I know mess is really important to yes. your work. And, yes. and, and I think you cite in your essay, someone on Radio 4 said that um, The Wasteland is a very messy poem. Yes, Lawrence Rainey, it, yes. Yes, which indeed. it really is. It is, yes. Um, but what... what I mean, some of your works, I'm not sure if... Yeah, maybe some of the cardboard ones, you can sometimes see the odd footprint on the... On the on literally on the ground that you use, mm -hmm. or the a little dog-eared corner, and mm -hmm. look, you can see the tape to the wall. Yep. What, what... Is that part of your interest in mess, that kind of incohate? Well, it part? came in with Elliot. I, I, before, before the Elliot sequence, I, I used quite nice paper and did it all properly. <laughs> but, uh, with Elliot, I mean, the, the work had to be done very quickly. Um, I was only told about it a few months before the show. And I got so into it with this huge backlog of passion about Elliot that I yes. have. And so um, I started using odd bits of paper in the studio and um, blotting paper and cardboard and stuff that I had around. And I thought, well, actually, it's quite fitting to use this for Elliot because of all the, the messiness in his work and this foul hotel where, where the work was going to be displayed. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I then let the footprints as Basquiat, he let his feet wander over his work. He didn't bother about it, and I thought, well, I can do it too. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I let foot, there was one over there with footprints on, and uh, it seemed to be quite a, quite a fitting way of treating Eliot, really. Yeah, definitely. You've, you've talked about it as the indelible stain of his poetry, mm. and I kind of think that the footprint is sort of connected to that, that there's something of you, yes. clearly you are the artist, but there's something, a physical imprint of how you made them uh, kind of creeping in. Yes, without yes, that's, that's, that's true, the sort of the stress and the strain of the making of mm, them. But sort of and something the, very, physic, a physicality beyond the painting of it. Oh, uh, right, that my presence. Of, yeah, mm. again, going back to, you know, what you've, uh, you, both of us identified in Elliot, that depth of feeling, it's almost like you can't keep your feet off the, Everything, every part of you is on the canvas or oh, on the I paper. See. Right, yes. I could go even further with that, I suppose, <laughs> couldn't I? But it's given me some ideas. Oh, oh that's <laughs> good. <laughs> <laughs> but going back, I just wanted to say, going back to Ovid, that the mess is very much part of it. And I did a series called Frenzy, which is a kind of bacchanalia of, of all these creatures turning into other things and limbs and branches and, and this whole reeling of Ovidian universe of, of transformation. And there are these kind of, sort of electric wires and lines going crossing all over it to show the, the a bit like your the cells and the planets, this interconnectedness of all things. 
because although it's a, a cruel and tragic world, Ovid's world is one in which things are so very much connected up, and there is that sense of, of sort of unit, cosmic unity, in, in I think in his. In but his even with world. desperation, with the the particularly the women in Ovid are not treated very well. No, they're not. No, no. So on a human scale, it's it's very dark. Yes, it is very dark. It is. It, it it's 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 horrible. And I I mean, now people are are not meant I think to read of it without warning because of all the rapes and the terrible um, cruel scenes um, but I think of it is just being um, true to a view of human precariousness of extreme vulnerability in the face of nature or as he would see it the gods where you know through error or ignorance people stumble into the path of a god and they're torn to pieces or turned into a, a bird or a tree or something and I think it's that again it's that vulnerability that I um, do when I paint figures that appeals to me and also this this nature made strange and made it very beautiful and and um, with this glorious light and as you say these extremes of, of horror and, and or melancholy and beauty mm. it seems that you're very inspired by um, or you use as a, a springboard the words of, of say, Ovid or, or mm. Eliot or back, back when I first met you, Marvel. Mm. Um, do, do you... What, what is it about working from these texts? Because you're not in any way illustrating these texts. They, mm. they, come, they kind of just allow you to go somewhere new. Is that the...? Yeah, I, I find them nourishing. They, mm. uh, I mean, at art school, we were th- it was thought to be a bad idea to use literature as, as a source because you would really? end up illus- illustrating right. them and the painting wouldn't sort of stand up in its own right with its own mm. internal dynamic and its own internal laws. Um, but I just, I just, as I say, I, I, got, I got to feel that the painters I liked, like Twombly particularly, did very well painting from literature and I think I think for me I need to find well they're poets I love and they they're poets that I that I can identify as having two qualities one is this preoccupation with metamorphosis and or three qualities the other is a strange kind of light as in Andrew Marvel's sort of bands of black shadow and dazzling sunlight um and then in uh, connection with the light, this idea of nature made strange, um, so that it's the real world but it's it's heightened in some way, so that the work I did on Shakespeare's Tempest or the work of the Ovid and various other poets, they all have those, those um, qualities. Mm. In, this, in this series, um, you not only you know, worked with, through all those, um, through the text, but you also went out and actually did some some core research, I seem to think, from on the canal down oh, here, yes. and things like this came mm-hmm. from yeah. observation. Mm. I mean, how did you? Because you have a you have a wonderful way of seeing um, the world we live in. So even when there's a big uh, kind of a casino event or a dinner party, or even just shopping in the supermarket, you see it with a way that does frame the isolation that that cities feel. Mm. Um, but but Eliot wrote about that, the kind of city unpicking itself a hundred years ago. So do you feel, when you look at London now, do you feel a connection to how he wrote about it, that kind of dirty, grimy side to it? Or Yes. I mean, round here there's a lot of dirt and, um, and you have to seek it out. And I did. I went down various arms of the canal where things were not as as chic or as, as um, fashionable. <laughs> it's been spruced up and, rather. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I did, I did um, f- find all that in um, the neighbourhood. Um, and London unpicking itself, well, I mean, at the moment, yes, I think, I'm afraid it is. We all know <laughs> why. <laughs> and um, it's a Brexit-free zone tonight. Yes, but please, think, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I suppose I, I, I find in London now the, the Eliot images of the commuters, the, 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 they're still potent, they still apply because I go up and down the escalators and I do um, drawings, you know, in the underground and he visited the underground in East Coker and, well, in the, what was it, Burnt Norton, I think, mm. in four quartets. So there's all that, that life in the city that's obviously still going on and it's very much Eliot's area of um, it was his area of work and and 
it's where he took his imagery from so uh yeah the city and the mess they're still they're still here and then of course the social life um his wonderful renderings of social awkwardness and people going to pieces in the presence of each other you know i only have to go out to i don't know hotel or restaurant I find little Elliot scenes <laughs> <laughs> that I can use. But it's interesting you say that he was socially awkward himself or didn't like those situations because mm-hmm. when you read The Wasteland the dialogue reads like a overheard mm. Mm. Um, fragments doesn't it? It doesn't yes. hear like something he was involved in but something he sort of overheard. It does but I think that that passage in part two a game of chess where there's those sort of awkward exchanges between the woman who's saying you know shall I run out and the street with my hair down and what is that noise and what is that what is the wind doing and the other person says nothing again nothing or something and and that maybe is an example of Elliot and his first wife having a bad conversation in the evening I don't don't know dear yeah do you think you'd work from Elliot again would you because you you clearly you mentioned many of the poems tonight but Mm. the there's a lot of richness in his work and mm. the connection with... Yeah, I mean, it's in, in, inexhaustible. I, I could do. Um, with the Ovid um, works, I find I'm going back to his characters, Tiresias and um, mm. Hyacinthus and... Um, who else? Oh, yes, Tereus and Philomela. Um, so Eliot, it's, they're partly Ovid and they're partly Eliot. And I, I suppose... Maybe not directly from lines in the wasteland, but the spirit of of the wasteland, I think, will be with me forever, really. Well, I, I think drop. we've we've seen, we've seen that in your work to date. That you know, for me, the riders that you did, the horse and riders, the first works I saw by you, are very much like the the kind of hooded hordes on the arid plains. But you get this sense of them just galloping on and on and on in this wilderness. That again goes back to that idea that you and Elliot connect to this unfathomable vast space of humanity that is not history as we've had it's it not recorded. contemporary you mean it's not just no now. it's it's no. timeless mm. and that's maybe why they're so beguiling yes i mean i well i hope so but i i like the idea of, i think again that figure that's neither male nor female is neither contemporary nor like the horsemen they belong to the now but then they don't they're kind of i don't know medieval or or um, samurai or something like that so they they can um, they have various su- suggest- su- suggestions and implications I think and are not shut down which is what's and not very shut important down to you. I think yes I mean I, th- I think um, uh, the unlimited and 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 mystery and mess um, are all very other things that really um, means a lot to my work mm. yeah um, I think we could probably talk all night. Yes. But can we talk for probably an hour? Um, I wondered if anyone had any questions they'd like to ask Susie, or you all probably know her. You've asked her everything you need to ask. Mm-hmm. Yes. I've got one question. Mm. Dante. Yes. Is the question mm-hmm. really? Mm. Um, you've talked about Ovid. Mm-hmm. Elliot takes you to Dante as well. He does. And you've yes. got obviously an interest in hell. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, of course you have. Mm. So I wondered if you've done anything on Dante. Oh, not Dante. yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's a loaded answer, isn't it? Would be a good idea. Yes. <laughs> yes. Look well, at the as well as not Ovid. No, Dante. when you finish with Ovid, you'll <laughs> sort of it. <laughs> <laughs> I just wonder. No, it's a wonderful idea. Because uh, yes, I'm I'm interested in the crowd coming over London Bridge. Yes, mm. Mm. and the extremes of bliss and hell. Yeah, mm. I think you write about Dante in here, don't you? you, mention, do. I, you mention well, I mentioned that. Um, yeah, I mentioned that Eliot takes us lower than urban filth into the underworld, and Dante is um, his is his guide, or uh, is, is Eliot's guide in a way. Eliot ha- had a copy of Dante with him always, didn't he? Yes. Um, so, yeah, I think I just mentioned this, the um, Dante being guided by Virgil or, or something like that, and this this whole um, cast of characters who go into the underworld in the wasteland, far below the the reality that we exist in. But it's a great idea. I'll need to get it out again because <laughs> I haven't looked at it for a long. What? By the way, Mary, what's a good translation? What would you? There's a new translation just out, and I can't remember who. It's lovely. 
okay. and I'll guess it for you. All right. <laughs> Well, you don't need to. You just tell me what it is. <laughs> it's going to be the end of the light, though, isn't it? The light is not going to burn the figures. You're just going to burn them with bitumen or tar or something. Well, when they get to paradise, they can be oh, burned true. in light. I mean, a lot of... <laughs> they think they've escaped at that point, and no, you're going to get for them even there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my figures get um, burned up in, in glory and ecstasy as well as in um, filth and horror. So Dante's. Yes, well, that's... that's You've opened a door there, <laughs> Mary. I see you're sorted for the next five years now. <laughs> At least. Yeah, true. Well, Ovid's going to take me a while. I mean, he feels endless. It really does. And, you know, you, all these strange forms that I can use, all the strange ways of painting to do with this metamorphic theme. Great. There's lots, there's lots still to come, we can feel. Um, has yeah. anyone else got any more questions? Yeah, right in the back. Just, uh, I was just looking at all the sketchbooks, Susie. Yes. Are they all full up? <laughs> Pretty much so. Not, 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 not with good things always, but there's some nice... Some are better than others. So um, and do you remember what you got in each? I mean, if you were to think to yourself, oh, I want a figure, no. would mm-hmm. you be able to pick them? No, no. <laughs> um, some have have um, titles on them, you know, like shopping mall or supermarket, but some don't. And uh, I just have to look through them and think, oh, this I could throw away, or this is nice, and this is a mixture. Um, do you go back through your sketchbooks much? I do, actually, yes. When I was doing some some bacchanalias of figures in forests for the Ovid pictures, I wanted some figures that were were sort of, when were they? I think they were beach figures. Um, and I wanted to look at various poses. So I do, I do use them as reference books. Yes. They're also double, I mean, you pro- can probably see from there, but <laughs> not just one tier of them. They're, yeah. they're all squashed in, goodness me, there's yeah. hundreds there. And I do throw quite a lot away, actually. Oh, so. <laughs> <laughs> or throw them our way. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I need a bigger studio, won't I? I mean, you know. Peter? <laughs> yes. Um, anyone else with a question? Sarah? Yes. Um, we've spoken quite a lot about the timelessness and the universality of Eliot's work, but to me, um, Eliot is quite specifically rooted in a Western locality. Um, mm. I'm, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how non-Western readers and the East figure in his work, because... A lot, it kind of seems like they're just presented as an object of like the extreme, and I just, I, I'd like to know your thoughts about. Please. Well, I think he was very educated in Eastern philosophy, mm-hmm. wasn't he? I mean, he was, he read Sanskrit and he studied the Upanishads, and he, um, I think, al- also Buddhism was an interest of his. And um, I mean, in the Wasteland, particularly, he refers to, to the Buddha's fire sermon, and then to the. Um, when, when the thunder comes at the end, um, that's a Hindu um, visitation, as of course is sans, um, the, the um, Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. So, I mean, I, I suppose, yes, he, he's based in, in, in the West and in the States and England, but he's obviously very influenced by other, other disciplines. He seems to span all kinds of times and, and, and areas of, of global religion and history. Was that what you what were yeah, you thinking I think of? I think it's quite interesting because um, it seems to me that people bring to his work as a sense of like the East as other rather than spanning and the universality and that mm. it's kind of, um, I've heard people talk about the deserts as being kind of representations of like the barrenness of the Middle East and this kind of thing but it's interesting that you see it again as a like a tying into a universality because of course the deserts could also refer to like deserts in America or mm-hmm. any of these places and mm. I think I like the sense that it's not just other, it is yeah, more to do with like eight. Yeah, I, I think he sees the desert everywhere, really. I, well, I mean, in cities and in um, the Antarctic, you know, the reference to Shackleton and, um, and then to that unspecified hot place where he's wanting water in the wasteland. I'm not sure quite where it is. Um, but then I suppose... Um, He's he's taking the myth of or, or, the, or the book of Exodus, where the figure is moving hopefully towards the promised land through the desert and is exiled from 
from its his rightful home. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, he is, I suppose, talking about the Middle East, but he's also talking about London. He's also talking about uh, the falling towers in Vienna and, and Alexandria and everywhere. He's, he seems to like to encompass everything, really. It's like an ursity or an ur landscape, isn't it? It's kind of, he splices everything together, but it's really a mythological landscape. And oh, right, so yeah. Well, I mean, I would say it's, yes. it's sort of beyond a real place in a way. Yes. But you're quite right. He, I mean, clearly he comes from a Western perspective. And although mm. he's incredibly well-read, um, and quite interestingly for the time, well-read beyond the Western text, yes. it, it, he's naturally going to come from that, that position, I think. So the, the, the Grail myth is, is so kind of... It goes back a thousand years. Um, he he's connecting into that sort of sense of a, a story that's so old; it's almost gone beyond mm. beyond reality. I mean, it clearly it is a a myth from the beginning, but it's it's come through as a story for so long. Yes. So I think, but it's a really interesting point. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was I was just going to say something about his his mysticism too. This uh, I suppose after the the wasteland, but. I'm interested in his use of nothing, you know, nothing as a, just a dead end, and then this kind of mystical Buddhist kind of nothing. I mean, it could be Christian, like the cloud of unknowing, but it, it's also to do with um, Eastern thought, um, where nothing, I mean, we're talking about things opening out onto the illimitable, but this negative theology, which he moves into more and more in his work, where you cannot identify or write about or talk about the absolute. And um, he likes to cancel out positive statements in favour of this empty space which suggests all things. Um, so I suppose that's another kind of Eastern, partly Eastern take on it. Or he just went to Margate and didn't like it because he talks about when he's in Margate. <laughs> That's I true. associate nothing with nothing, or yes. I paraphrase. But well, I think yeah. I mean, I think there are two kinds of no well, maybe more than two, but one kind of nothing is just absolute boredom and dead end and nothing and a cul-de-sac, and the other sort of nothing is the reverse. It's it's um, it's erasing rather like mess. It erases neatness and positive statements in favour of all kinds of possibility and potential. It's it's like um, Roland Barthes, his um, contrast between a text which gives pleasure and it shuts down and is, is neat and contained and a text which gives jouissance, which opens out onto this, um, yeah, this, this ecstatic, infinite possibility um, through, through unmaking, through destroying, through iconoclasm. It unmakes the neat in favour of um, all possibilities. Well, that's certainly what you do with your work, that you don't well, lock them it? down. I yes, of course so. it is. I hope that so. They, they, I they are, there's so much possibility we can, we feel it, the energy that crackles through them. Mm, that's nice that it crackles. I like that. Always crackles. The force that <laughs> through the green fuse drives the flower. That's very nice. Are there any more questions before I bring it to a close? Mm -hmm. No, well, I think we can officially okay. say thank, thank you so for the third time, Susie. Thank you very, very <laughs> brilliant.